modern technology by virtue of being the youngest research cluster. You may not look like it, but uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the institutional structures, this is the case. I'll try and explain something of the rationale of the cluster, of our approach, uh, and then my colleagues Nicholas and Juan will uh, provide some examples that I hope will, 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 will feed a discussion afterwards. We're going to have to be quite snappy, I'm aware of that, so please forgive me if I talk uh, faster than is comfortable. There's been a recent argument in the literary press between Noam Chomsky, who is obviously heavily invested in the notion of language as an instinct, and the writer Tom Wolfe. Wolfe picks up some of the objections to the notion of a language instinct. And his rationalization of the situation, of the argument against an instinct, is that we should view language as a technology. It's a technology because it is to an extent artificial but it's grounded in human behavior, needs, affordances. It works by consensus, by a reinforcing feedback system. It develops its own structures and dynamics. And I think this argument, in a way, uh, encapsulates the approach that we're taking to looking at music in, in this group. So technology is artificial. It's not entirely arbitrary, but it's one possible, each instance is one possible point in an immense search space. It enables you to do things to imagine things. So, what we would say is that music is literally inconceivable without technology. Rather than the set of enabling tools that technology constitutes through conventional music histories, it's actually constitutive of the way we imagine music, the way we conceive music, the way we discuss music, the models for music that we have in our minds. And there's an important writer I should introduce here that when we talk about technology, we don't just mean things you plug in, we don't just mean things that have some kind of computational capacity, we don't just mean things that were made in a factory. This is a fundamental point. We're talking about soft technologies as well. We're talking about the models of thought that technology uh, introduces to human reasoning. So, the group starts from a very practical musician's question, contemporary musician's question. How do you find a discourse for the hybrid works that we tend to make nowadays? They're hybrid on several axes. They're notated, improvised, they're composition, sound art, they have degrees of identity, of situatedness. Uh, they have human legible communication representation. They have code, machine readable representations. But I'd argue that this reflects a wider question. How do we talk about music? How do we engage with it on a technical level? However, unconsciously, in our sort of individualized polylinguistic context, there's no one style, no one language uh, of the repertoire and offer that will really cover the breadth of things that we're talking about. So, what could be a relevant, exploratory, creative, critical discourse that's not just descriptive of a single style? This question is acute in music education, as I'm sure you're all aware, but also in the public sphere that we need so urgently. I'll briefly, uh, briefly explain this rationale. Yesterday I mentioned Eichenbaum. In his work on cinema, he famously said that there's nothing natural about art. What's natural is that art is a human need. We might see the way art works, the way music works, as creating resonances between individual versions of culturally common models of thought, operational metaphors, if you like. In this sense, our engagement with music is not just technological, it's technical. These models could be seen as originating in science, technology, the various cognates. They're a repertoire of the kinds of operations that we imagine to be possible. They're what Harry Corbin and Collins calls tacit operational knowledge. Ours is a self-consciously technological age, like no other, so it seems appropriate to look there for, con uh, for a repertoire of common concepts. Technological possibilities are absorbed, assimilated, they become part of our thinking. We talk very easily in many contexts of networks, feedback, systems, interfaces. We cut and paste, digitize more often. My grandmother, bless her soul, wouldn't have had a clue what I'm talking about. But we use these kind of expressions very easily, very instinctively in many areas. 
We know where these ideas come from, but most, most of we have little idea as to how they really function. Yet we happily apply them as metaphors, as functional metaphors in many areas of life. So such terms are the, are the surface of a deep sea of common concepts that might suggest a constructive and explanatory discourse for music rather than the reductive, descriptive, or downright arcane notions that tend to be on offer. There's what I hope will be a catalytic double bind here. One of the major pursuits of our time is the attempt to understand the nature of digital objects and behaviors and the knowledge they engender. The boundaries of so-called real and virtual are not clear. Musical works have much in common with this new world of augmented reality, materiality. They exist in a unique state of materiality, immateriality. They're situated, embodied, shared, and distributed. In cultural terms, music is the area of human activity in which we deal with the virtual, with a constructive relationship between human effect and abstract structures or formal systems. The instruments, theory, processes, and comprehension of music pass through a single node, technology. Viewed from this perspective, they become a single plan. That's why tracing or plotting music objects from a technological perspective will help us see how they're distributed through social, temporal, technical dynamics. Seen this way, there's no problem distinguishing, say, score-based compositions from so-called improvisation, or sound art from music. Each instance has its own map of determination through time, through social structures, and through material and cognitive technologies. An important text. We inhabit a space in which music from other times and places is also part of current contemporary activity. If such models have any useful power as discourse, they should be able to generate useful new understanding as to why this music is relevant to us. So technologies are distributed through people, social structures, other technologies, through time. Soft technologies are vital, those of instrumental technique, culturally assimilated ones, cognitively assimilated ones, the piano, for instance, we were talking about yesterday. What about air guitar? Representation, representation, the, the inscription of music, but also the the models that we adduce in trying to engage with it. We could construct a history of Western music in terms of the technologies of representation, the materiality of inscription. In fact, a three-minute history, right? Stories of Pythagoras always refer to whatever you like, the harmonious blacksmith, the monochord, Gridonian hand. If that's not a technology, I don't know what it is. If that's not an embodied mode of understanding music, the verge escape from clock, 39. What happens in musical representation at the same time? You start measuring time by parceling off your segments of it. Within 20 years, the same invention. The cartella, the wax tablet on which Palestrina and his contemporaries would calculate complex polyphonic structures. No score. You have to use algorithms to understand what's going on. You're restricted, your, your composition, your thought process is determined by the materiality of inscription. Experimental physics in France, beginning of the 18th century, Rameau completely changes. The, it may look, the notation may look the same. What it represents cognitively is orthogonally related to what went before. Bach, beautiful handwriting, no sketches. What happens in the 18th century? We invent chemical processes for producing paper, white paper, much more cheaply, much more evenly. Beethoven, he can use paper like we use a hard drive. He can store half-baked ideas in case they might be handy 20 years later. And then he can fold them over and see how they work together. The technologies of representation at the end of the 19th century, the big thing is changes in musical understanding. I'll recognize that. Adagietto from the Fifth Symphony of Mahler. Highly undernotated by Mengelberg. You know, Edison's representative was recording Brahms in Vienna in 1889, I think. Recording was in the air. Mahler complained to Freud that all he could do was parody what he heard around him. It's a recording mode of representation. And even that doesn't capture everything. Uh, this is from the New York Philharmonic Archive. It's a horn part prepared by Bernstein for the performance. But the horn player had to add certain things that Mahler simply couldn't. You, know, you can't actually see probably what it says at the bottom there. On there. It says watch like a bastard. 
Schoenberg's mechanisms for calculating some of his compositions. Calculating is perhaps an inappropriate word, but there's an element of that in it. So Schoenberg is seeing notation, the mode of representation, as a symbolic system. He's exploring it in that direction. He's the complement of Mahler. I mean, Mahler, of course, supported Schoenberg in many ways. There's an argument for suggesting that they're almost the same person. They're two sides of the same person. And of course, this is the time of people like Frege trying to bring mathematics, uh, symbolic logic, together with philosophy. Graphical ways of dealing with the same problem as you picked. Open music from here, Cam. How I work. Multiple representations completely technologically facilitated. And what we were listening to yesterday evening a map, a network, a way of conceiving of music uh, fundamentally informed by a decade of work with the Zoom <coughs> studio in Freiburg. So how do we approach this? We take a cue from the father of media theory, Friedrich Kittler, who said that media science will remain near media history as long as the practitioners of cultural studies know higher mathematics only from hearsay. We distill a set of technological metaphors that are culturally diffuse in common usage in many contexts, and then we see how we can develop a finer grained understanding of how they might work as operational, technical models for creating and understanding music by working back towards areas where they have specific uh, technical implications. I'll just demonstrate one to you very briefly before I hand over to my colleagues. The notion of wave models. Wave models, of course, are used in many contexts for designing airplanes, for predicting the weather. We're dependent on them in many areas of life. Bill Viola suggested, uh, just after he moved from being a sound artist to being a video artist, that waves are the natural mode of understanding time-based art. These standard kinds of phenomena listed there. Now, until recently, there was a major problem working with this sort of thing. Uh, it was kind of complicated to calculate. We can do a little better now, uh, although the European <coughs> Meteorological Office just commissioned a new machine that I think probably won't fit in obvious. And we can just bring waves of sound in. Thank you. 
fully trap them. So in, in taking up the challenge of joining another cluster in, the, in this fine institution, I, I took the opportunity to basically look back from the times where I wasn't a researcher and I wasn't a composer and I wasn't an electronic musician, although I was more of an electronic musician than I thought I was. And I started looking back into the tools and the techniques that I developed from my period before being an academic musician, so being a, a rock guitarist. And uh, the, my role in this nascent, is nascent a word? Yeah. A nascent uh, cluster is and will be to take a look at the tools that are widely available for musicians that are perhaps not part of academia and see how much those tools and by extension a wider uh, group of people relate to technology in ways that perhaps are subdued by the availability, the massive availability of them. So my focus in this cluster would be first and foremost the idea of network technologies which is something that I have spoken in the past um, and I see network technologies today as uh, I see tape and recording techniques in the 60s in the sense that things are aiming to be as transparent as possible but we are still experiencing the engineering shortcomings of a technology that is still not quite there. So, um, and the second uh, case study that I will focus on had to do with delays, feedback, and looping as compositional and performative techniques. Uh, that, let's say, the, the sophisticated version of which you heard partly in the, in the system that Jonathan demo. Uh, what I just did today is uh, the more rudimentary uh, flavor of it, it's still playing. And basically, why delays feedback and looping? Because to me, those are um, notions that without the understanding of the technology behind them, I think that both musically, but also as a metaphor in, real, in the real life and real world. So for Jonathan's grandmother and my own grandmother, it's a notion that is easier to understand. So uh, one of the most, um, uh, let's say, recursion as a concept is something that comes to mind. Uh, and one of the most simple examples uh, is this idea of in order to get a job you need experience and to get that experience you need to have a job. Or in my case, in order to get a work permit you need a residence permit and <laughs> you know how it goes. And so these tools, uh, I think that they have informed and transformed the musical landscape, both in academic and popular music. And one of the things that I want to start working on and exploring have to do with this idea of how much the academic musical world still pushes forward the development of technologies, but uh, the commercial world uh, refines, uh, let's say, the, the emulation of ancient ones and tries to promote that as what is the top of the technological development. Uh, this is what you just heard is a, is a very good example because I have here technologies from the 1960s, the 70s, the 90s, and the 2000s, and the, they all sound similar. And what that means is that it's not that there is a, not a potential to do further things with these tools, but basically that when there's a let's say that the, the research component matches the research and development of technology, there's always a trade-off in terms of what could be massively available. And I think that there is something to be said about um, that imposition, that limitation that commerce uh, imposes on the tools that are being developed. Yeah, sorry. So how these limitations that commerce produces also mean that popular musicians have developed a way of interacting with the tools that sometimes when you go to a, let's say a, a popular music event surpasses what is presented the, in academic concerts. That is something that perhaps not with sound only but with multimedia events is, is much clearer I think and we can agree on that. So 
that crack is something that I want to explore. What happens there when uh, we limit the technology and we get better at it, which is basically something that is imposing the constraints of a traditional instrument on, on things that are constrainless otherwise. So the case study that, that led me to focus on these particular tools or this particular musical phenomena uh, was a project that I developed a couple of years ago that was based on the reconstruction and the challenge of the performance practice of Carl Hans Stockhausen's solos uh, with a number of researchers and musicians among them, Karen the Plate, who is present here. And basically, the focus of that particular project was uh, twofold. The first was how to update the technology just for sheer preservation of the, the work. At the same time, in that updating the technology from tape delays to digital media, how to preserve the constraints, mainly for the technical operator, in this case the electronic performer, as a way of defending the fact that those limitations and the, and the resistance between the performer and the limitations were the, mus uh, were the musical contribution of the technologies in that piece would lie. Uh, and also using it as a platform to explore the use of network technologies as a way of bringing in different uh, simultaneous versions and adding timbre complexity to a piece that otherwise lacked that. Uh, so that was the case study that led me to work on these systems in a more systematic way now. Uh, and there is a research catalog entry that you can review. I can pass the link later, you can take a snapshot now. Three, two. And the second case study is the more is, is in the same stage that, that the cluster is at now, which is the idea of, of looking at the electric guitar. The electric guitar as again a platform for understanding music as a receiver. The idea of air guitar was mentioned by Jonathan before, but also as a, as a tool that is widely available and that, at least in my personal case, gave me a, a way of understanding music and music making that has informed my work as a composer and as an electronic performer in, in as much as just for the very, from the very beginning you need to understand your instrument as a, as a system that is an interaction between the, the actual guitar, the amplifiers, the effects that you put in between and I think that that is something that uh, I, I honestly believe and hope that practitioners that are not academic practitioners but have a, a, a valuable information and knowledge that I would be able to work with them to try to extrapolate the things that, that they are part of what they do and, and try to find ways of, of sharing that as, as, let's say, in a corpus of, of information that is more academically uh, uh, valued. So the first, uh, so the idea of, of the, the instrument as a technical musical system rather than just an instrument, the idea of a platform for experimentation of new technologies, although sometimes those new technologies are limited by the commercial constraints, and then uh, the, the project, the study subjects that I want to focus on are, of course, Jimi Hendrix in the studio and the transition of those innovative works in the studio into the live concert situation. Uh, Robert Fripp and Frippertronics, uh, and two current or more contemporary cases, uh, Omar Rodriguez Lopez and Nels Klein, which are all musicians that are very dear to me, but probably just don't, they don't ring a bell to you, and that's perfectly fine. That's my job <laughs> to, to make it happen. And I, now I pass the, the torch to Nick. And if I don't stop this. <laughs> Hi. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm the, uh, I'm the fifth wheel here, and um, I'm doing what you should never do live, which is I'm, I'm, I'm running code. Uh, so, I'd like to talk just a moment about uh, feedback um, as a recurring thread in this cluster. Uh, I'm a remarkably old person and have been working with feedback since 
1974. Uh, I think actually it's 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 uh, lesson one in electronic music is always feedback, and, and we all write the same piece over and over again. I was a student of Alvin Lussier, and and for me as a young person when I was 17, it. It was a paradigm that got me going as a composer. I come from a background of, of architectural historians, and so it was the link between architecture and music that finally gave me the foolish idea I could, I could soldier on in, in, in the field of music. Um, to put it briefly, every room is essentially a baroque trumpet. Uh, it is a musical instrument. This is not metaphorical. This is real. And uh, because it's very large, the overtone series, by the time it gets up in the audible range, is, is very close together. And uh, what the strong modes are in the room is a question of an architect applying uh, a lot of empirical knowledge into designing things so it's pretty flat. Uh, no one gets a perfectly flat room. There is always the inherent music. Now, this is a work that dates from my student days and um, subsequently was ported over to software at the Knots. And it's a, uh, it's a good case study in, in feedback, because what we have here is we have three microphones, and each is going to one speaker. And each microphone is up loud enough that it's starting to feed back. That's what you hear. However, um, that's one form of feedback. That's what's called positive feedback. That's what happens when you have a gain of greater than one. Things cascade, and the gain hits a ceiling point, and it brings out whatever the most efficient mode is in the system. And in the case of acoustic feedback, that means a tone. What is the most efficient tone in a system like this? The stronger resonance is in the room. This is what happens when you go like this, and you move the mic, you play the overtones of the room, right? I'm sure we've all done this, even if we won't admit it. Um, However, this system applies a second form of feedback, and the one that is actually more important in the world, which is negative feedback, control feedback. The engineer who has started to feedback with the microphone jerks it away in an attempt to stop the feedback, right? Well, that's what this does automatically. It has a control feedback system so that every time the feedback starts, the electronics effectively start to pull the microphone back from the speaker shift it over to another mode, okay? As it turns out right now, it's deciding not to move, but there it goes again, okay? So what it does is it creates, along with flickering video images, I don't know why that's happening, it creates a set of sort of simple melodies out of the room by a mixture of the control feedback, as I said, and the positive feedback, right? This is clear. Okay, so, um, what we end up with is, this is exceedingly irritating, so I'm going to make it go away. Um, what, we make, what we end up with is electronic music, right? for want of a better term. Yeah. The feedback is what we are hearing, what we see is what we get. Okay. However, um, I have a, a great deal of interest in working with musicians, and in particular in open form work. So, after many years of puttering around with moving the microphone around in various fashions. I decided I wanted to map the data that you get from a feedback analysis of the room into something more like conventional notation for instruments to play. So this is a more recent work, which really should not be seen in, in this form, but it's what we're going to do today because we're a little bit pedagogic. And um, what this piece does is it does an acoustic analysis of this room using a technique that live sound engineers often do, which is if you get into a concert hall before a concert begins, this is mostly for rock concerts, you'll see an engineer turning up a microphone in the mixer until feedback starts, and then he looks at the EQ on his board, and he finds the pitch, and he dips it down so that he can get more gain before feedback. Old trick. However, to do that, you have to have a good ear, and you have to have time two things that I probably don't have. So what I did instead was I programmed my computer to look for the 24 strongest frequencies in the room. And what's going to happen when I turn this thing on, hopefully, is it will raise the gain of a microphone until it gets feedback. 
It will zoom a filter in to notch it out. The feedback will stop. It will raise the gain of the PA another dB, and it'll keep doing this. And while it does it, it's going to transcribe those pitches onto the music staff. All right, so let's see if this works. So what you see at the left is the strongest resonant mode of the room. And as you move to the right, you get into the more and more remote harmonic regions. Okay? Uh, we boosted the gain of the whole system down in the bottom. We can see where the filters drop the gain in those bands. Okay? And if you don't understand any, you, if you understand only one half, that's great. That's more than most of my students do. So, so there we are. And what we now have after this little, you know, 60-second electronic intro is we have notation. We can basically make this part go away and just look at what's up top. And um, we now have the option of performing this. There comes the composer. He says, everybody just play that first note, which in the case of my dopey improvising pianist, is relatively dull to listen to. But if you have a bunch of musicians, as you'll see in a moment, less is more. We add another one. Play combinations of these. The pianist hasn't woken up yet today, which is why it's a little slow. Okay. And you're sort of building up this harmony. And this harmony is the four strongest notes of the room. And then at a certain point, I tell the musicians, you can not only play these notes, but you can play any octave of the note that's on the same side as middle C. Simple distinction to keep the low zones of the room low and the high zones high. And then, just when the audience is beginning to nod off, we have what we in music call a change. And we move ahead. Okay. And over the course of 15, 20 minutes, we basically transform this, this architectural tone row into a sequence of chords. Okay. And um, it's interesting because every room has its own peculiar internal harmony, but it of course doesn't correspond to the rules of functional harmony the way we look at it. Yet it's not random. It exists somewhere in between, right? And of course, it's different in every room, which is kind of charming, because what it means is that with 60 seconds, a microphone and a loudspeaker, you can generate a score that's resonant, as it were, to a particular piece of architecture. And when you leave the gig at the end of the day, you hand them a PDF, and you say, look, if you're ever looking for a tune to play in this room, this would seem pretty natural. And I'm registered with GAMA. Uh, so, uh, there we go. I'm not going to um, bore you with this whole thing, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to end by playing you a, um, let's see, I want to hide this thing for now. What I'm going to do is just play you a, a little example of what it's like when proper musicians do this job. So here we have, um, this is at Mills College in Oakland, California, and uh, Fred Frith, who's a rather stellar improviser of a certain age, as we 
would like to say, uh, runs a, um, what did I do? Oh, I think I, no, there we are, okay, fine. Uh, he runs a graduate program in improvisation. set of grad students. I was in residence there, and I did a version of this. There are 11 players. Some of them are on stage, the electric ones, and unfortunately the ones with the least hair, which is a bad move from an audience standpoint. And the others are distributed around the room. Here you see the analysis being done at the beginning, and let's move forward a little bit to see what they do today. care all of this stuff is up on YouTube of course and um, the second thing is that it's an example of using this tool which we think of as inherently electronic when you think feedback you think Mr. Hendricks you think microphones and PAs and figuring out a way to use it as a, uh, a tool for generating more conventional music material that can be forwarded onto what we might call a totally different form of technology which is acoustic instruments, instruments that you don't necessarily associate with a Marshall stack. Okay, thank you, that's it.